Good morning, everyone. I hate interrupting the um, chat conversation mingling. So I'm glad that that is working out. It sounds like our volumes are a little high. I'll back up a little bit. Welcome back, day two of BioC 2023. I have a, just a couple of announcements before our first speaker. Uh, we had a very nice dinner last night um, for the organizing committee, uh, thanks to Erica. And um, I was reminded there uh, that we are doing this work in a place that is um, a place in an institution that uh, has uh, a history. And there are aspects of that history that we need to be mindful of, in particular, the land on which our institutions are built, uh, formerly belonged to indigenous people of the country. It's also somewhat remarkable to see that Harvard has you know, recently had findings leading it to invest $100 million in the study and, and, and reparation or redress of its involvement with the enslavement of people. And um, I'm just mentioning this on the advice of, of one of my colleagues at the dinner. And um, I only ask us to be mindful of the things that our institutions do and that we do and the effects that they have. Um, other announcements are at 11.30, there will be the Bioconductor Awards ceremony, and that's right before lunch, right here. So please do come for the awards. They are um, always enjoyable and important for the uh, collaborating community. We're gonna try and collect information um, we haven't got the instruments in place yet, but this is a great opportunity for folks to think about uh, aspects of bioconductor that they think uh, should be done better. And um, we will be posting a link to the poll, which is going to be mostly open text um, for you to describe things that are working for you and things that are not. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to get a lot of information to help improve the project. project. Uh, one last point has to do with lightning talks. There are uh, a number of open slots for lightning talks. I think that will that opportunity will close tonight to sign up for lightning talks. And I really would encourage people to uh, take advantage of that. I'm not going to do it, so you don't have to save a space for me. But um, please uh, do consider that. I think many people here have um, uh, a lot to say uh, about their work and the project, and uh, I really invite you to, to um, sign up and, and give a talk. So with that, um, I'm going to welcome Beth Simony uh, from the Broad Institute, who's gonna tell us about uh, taking advantage of microscopy. Thank you. Morning, everybody. All right, everyone awake? Cool. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Beth Simony. Uh, I'm the Associate Director for Bioimage Analysis for the Imaging Platform uh, in the Byrne Institute all the way across the river in Cambridge. Um, and I'm going to have three main parts in this talk. We're going to talk about, first of all, just what are the awesome things that we can learn from images? Uh, what are the things that are currently hard to learn from images? And how can we help our community access these advances? <laughs> Uh, I'm unfortunately not going to be talking about, you know, specific R packages and things that much today because I mostly use Python. Please don't kick me out. <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm very excited about all the work Bioconductor is doing and bringing all these amazing packages together. And I really enjoyed watching all the talks yesterday and hearing about some of the things that this community is putting together using Bioconductor. Uh, so why images? And uh, after watching all the talks yesterday, I wanted to adjust this statement a little bit. Why images besides just spatial transcriptomics? Um, so biological images, in addition to being pretty, um, are, can actually be really informative. Um, we get information about single cells sort of for free in a way that has been really hard for other techniques to get up to that speed. 
We get information about molecule, molecular interaction. We can do this in live cells so we can see actually what's going on in real time. And we can see not just if molecules expression levels are changing, but if the behavior the cell has is changing. So we're really actually accessing phenotype in a way that it is harder for a lot of other techniques. And so we really feel passionate about the idea of microscopy as a rich data source. Um, but we, we do have a lot of baggage in microscopy, which means compared to things like sequencing, um, we're behind in a lot of ways in terms of quantification. And it's because most of microscopy's history is qualitative. When people think about microscopy, they think about things like these absolutely gorgeous drawings from Ramon e. Cajal, where he drew to the best of his ability what he saw, and that was qualitative. Um, and even, you know, as this is work from my undergraduate, you know, 15 years ago down the river at BU, go Terriers. Um, uh, representative image shown um, as I was writing up this paper that was the, the culmination of my senior undergrad thesis. Um, and my boss advised me just, just print out all the pictures, organize them on the floor by treatment, and then just like figure out what conclusions you can draw when you have them all laid out on the floor. You know, we, we did a little bit of like, oh, here's a line profile of like the purple versus the green to see, but it, still mostly qualitative. And so we have this 400 years of baggage where you know, nobody ever analyzed single cell RNA-seq without a computer. But we have 400 years of people doing this with microscope images, which has made it a little bit harder to get people to lock on to the idea of microscope images as data. Um, but we're working to try to change that. Um, I'm one of three PIs in the imaging platform. Uh, another one of the amazing PIs, Shantanu Singh, is sitting right there in the back. Um, please do talk to him because he knows a lot more about Bioconductor than I do. Um, but we are working to write software that turns images into answers, um, especially user-friendly software. We're trying to bring uh, the advances that this amazing community builds and make it easy for people to access. And so, with that in mind, and uh, how have software and data science changed how we're approaching high content imaging? Um, this paper is about 10 years old now, but I'm not actually sure how different it would be if we if the same thing was done today. Um, in terms of papers that called themselves high content screening, um, most of in their titles, most of them when they act, you actually dig into the data did lots and lots and lots of microscopy, but only reported one or two cellular features. Something like you know, did the cells get bigger, or are, did the cells get brighter in a particular marker? Um, and that's frankly just really a shame because you know, microscopy images are arrays, and I have to hit this one a little harder usually when I'm talking to biologists than when I'm talking to this room, but these are arrays. These are just very big arrays, and so, you know, the standard microscope camera is four megapixels, which is four million data points every time we snap that camera, and you might do it multiple times for multiple uh, multiple dyes or multiple Z plans or multiple time points. And so we can build up terabytes and terabytes and terabytes, ask my cloud bill, um, really, really quickly. Um, and so to only report one or two measurements is frankly just leaving so much data on the table and it's frankly a waste. So what can we do to get more answers out of that same amount of data? Um, and so the software that we typically use in the lab uh, to do this and to actually extract all of this information is called Cell Profiler. Um, the first version was written 20 years ago by Ann Carpenter and Ray Jones. Um, it turns 20 this year, so we need to have a little Cell Profiler birthday party. Um, and I mostly show this slide because I want to sh uh, shout out, you know, there have been more than 100 people who've committed to the code base at this point. Um, but the, these are the people who've sort of committed the most to the code base. And particularly, I want to point out that it's always, from the whole history of Cell Profile, literally down to the first day, been a mixture of people whose original training is in software engineering, who are outlined in blue here, um, and people whose original training is in biology, who are outlined in green here, including me. My, I have a PhD in molecular biology. Um, and I think the fact that we've always had both kinds of training working on the same code base at the same time has really helped to make sure that our software is always tuned towards the people who really want to use it and the sort of language that they use to describe problems and helped it you know, last 20 years, which in software years is, is pretty old. Um, I'm not going to just do like a whole cell profiler demo, but uh, I just want to sort of briefly introduce you to the tool to give you a sense of what it's doing. Um, cell profiler is essentially an image analysis, no code workflow tool. We have this concept called a pipeline, um, very similar to lots of other tools um, in, in the sort of other uh, it, omics spaces where, again, we're taking individual modules of individual operations we might want to do and sticking them together in a discrete order in a conf config file that is human editable and human readable, but also machine editable and readable. 
um, and the user can go in and change the, the settings in each part of the config file, except they don't realize it's a config file because it's a GUI with fun buttons. Um, the most important button in Cell Profiler from our point of view is the help button. Um, Cell Profiler, uh, I think I'm going to mention this in my next slide, has about a thousand settings um, and each and every one of them has this help button next to it and has um, help text written by a, a biologist trained uh, person because users are going to get lost if you don't have the ability to, for them to say, all right, I don't remember what a thousand different settings do. I just want to analyze my data and go back to my experiments. Um, we have a test mode where you can go in and mess around with settings and then you, once you're done mess messing around with settings, you set your output and you hit analyze and it will automatically multi-thread. It's easy to then transfer workflows from a local machine to a cluster. It's a lot of good things going on. Um, so yeah, we've had two major migrations in the code base which have made life extra fun. Um, uh, MATLAB to Python 2 and Python 2 to Python 3. Um, and I'd want to point out that about um, 30% of the lines of code in the tool is actually documentation and manual code. It's not, um, and so we have a really high fraction of that. And again, I think this is part of what helps keep us relevant. Um, uh, so 30, sorry, 30% 30 within the modules and then 23% total. Um, and we serve this very interesting user base, which is about 90%, uh, I've never opened the terminal, I never will. If you try to make me, I will leave. Um, and 10%, um, I would like to run this on my high, high, uh, high power, High powered compute so I can process, uh, you know, 1,384 well plates. So we have to try and serve these two masters in the same code base, which always makes life fun. Um, yeah, so you can, again, um, without sort of belaboring the point, you can add and subtract and reorder things. But again, all of this is ultimately at its heart a sparkling config file. Um, but by focusing on what are things that users want to do and naming them and grouping them in ways that users see as logical uh, as logical operations, even though computationally sometimes we have many very different uh, algorithms sort of living together in one module, um, we help make sure that um, users can build flexible workflows. Um, we give them the ability to sort of turn modules on and off so you can sort of mess around with is a particular thing helpful or not. Um, you can sort of check the effects of blocks of things um, and, you know, when it is in error because the user changed the name of something and the name change hasn't propagated downstream, we try and help you out. Um, and so what does this get us beyond the ability to sort of, you know, now we can analyze lots of images in the same way, whether or not you know how to code. Um, the major thing that Cell Profiler, again, I think has helped it last for as long as it has um, that is really special is it helps us build up big measurement suites. So again, we want to go beyond one or two measurements. We want to do lots and lots and lots and lots of measurements. Um, and so we didn't invent most of these metrics. Most of these already existed, um, but it makes it easy to get lots of them. And so some of them are the things that if you're thinking about what a microscope image looks like and what you might get from it, things like the intensity of a particular marker. You know, I added, you know, GFP whatever, how much GFP whatever is in each one of my cells. Um, and if you want to get a little bit fancier than that, we can look at the distribution of the intensity. We can say, is it, you know, if we divide the cell into concentric rings, is it all in the center? Is it all at the edge? Is it even? Um, is it re distributed evenly on one side versus the other? Um, so we can, we can get relatively uh, granular in terms of our ability to look at where the intensity of individual markers is. Again, also things that you might think about, like the cell size and shape, um, you know, is it more like a circle or more like a line? Um, what is the orientation of the objects? Um, colocalization, once we start getting multiple markers, um, you know, are they in the same place or do they tend to be anti-correlated? But all of those things that humans are used to thinking about when we're used to thinking about images, it turns out um, are very, very far from the whole story. Um, so these are imaging flow cytometry images uh, in different cell cycle phases. Um, who's going to come up and put them and like mark the cell cycle phase for each one? Nobody ever, nobody ever says yes to that. I don't know why. Um, and it's because it's hard. Um, you know, you might have guessed that these are in a sequence, but um, but with 
feature extraction in these bright field images, a computer can do it very, very well with either sort of conventional features or deep learning based features. And even the mistakes that it makes are mistakes that kind of make sense. It's not confusing S for, you know, telophase all the way at the end of the cell cycle. It's confusing it with the ones on either side of it. And these switches aren't perfectly switch-like. And so to some degree, the mistakes in our algorithm are actually just mistakes of we are humans forcing things to be in finite bins that are not actually belonging in finite bins. And this is just a pretty spinny movie showing, you know, in feature space, we can cluster things by cell cycle phase and they cluster. So with this information that again, our human brains literally have no access to, but computational measurements do, what can we start doing? Well, we can start measuring things like Zernike polynomials. Essentially, how much does your cell look like one of these shapes? Um, if I tell you your cell is twice as big, that you probably get a picture in your head. If I tell you your cell has twice as big of a Zernike 1, 3 polynomial, probably doesn't tell you anything about what the cell looks like. But if we take these polynomials and we add them up, we can start getting pretty accurate descriptors of cell, cell shape that are not perfect, but are certainly better than what we were getting just from sort of perimeter and orientation. So they're not human intuitable, but they're undeniably useful. Um, we can do things like texture measurements, some of which are human intuitable and some of which are, are very uh, human brain unfriendly. Um, and But the ability to sort of take all of these and generate lots of measurements led to this field of image-based profiling, sometimes we call it morphological profiling, which is just the idea that in the same way um, that people are now routinely extracting thousands of gene uh, expression levels and it's are lots of different SNPs, um, can we get cell features, some of which are going to be human intuitable and some of which are not, and put those into a thing where now we can very easily in high throughput get lots and lots of data, create lots of morphological profiles, image-based profiles, and then do unsupervised clustering and see what interesting biology falls out. Um, so this is one of my favorite papers from sort of the early part of the field. Um, here we have drugs that we're trying to group into known mechanism of action classes. Um, and we have a nuclear stain and two cytoskeleton stains, actin and tubulin. Um, you're going to be not that excited here, about 67%, until I tell you uh, this is just with the nucleus. With just the nucleus alone, we can get 67% accuracy of reclustering these drugs into their mechanism of action classes, including things like protein synthesis not happening in the nucleus. Um, but we can get all of the protein synthesis inhibitors back into their classes with just nuclear data. When you include all of the channels, you get up to 94%. And again, even the mistakes uh, that the algorithm is making, DNA damage and DNA replication are incredibly interlinked at the biological level. So some of these mistakes are not really mistakes in class so much as mistakes in, you know, finiteness. Um, and so that led folks at the Broad and Carpenter and Stuart Schreiber in particular to develop what we call the cell painting assay. Um, so the idea is essentially how many organelle dyes can you possibly cram into a standard four color high content microscope. Um, so we can make as many rich measurements, many of which will be redundant, um, but many of which will not be. Um, and so at about $100 to $200 per 384 well plate, which uh, I've looked at the prices for like Visium these days, this is a lot cheaper. <laughs> um, we, can, we can start gathering just information about cells or we can generate these large, relatively unbiased morphological profiles where now we can again start looking at how things are similar or different and do really interesting biology. Um, so this is, to me, the paper that sort of convinced me like, oh, this approach really, really works. Um, so if you're not a member of the RAF, uh, RAF RAS pathway biologist, this is cell painting data that's in, clustered in cell painting feature space, and we've zoomed in just on sort of one part. What hopefully everyone can see is, you know, replicate alleles of overexpression of particular cancer-related genes. Um, we, the replicates are always clustering right next to each other, which is very nice. And then the next cluster over, are cancer-causing alleles of these particular genes. And so in cell painting feature space, which has no RAF or RAS marker, we can see that these things are all pretty similar and that these are almost the same, but they're a little bit different. Um, and so Mohamed Raban, who was a postdoc at the time and now has his own lab, um, spent a lot of time looking at these clustergrams and looking and saying, what are pathway-pathway interactions that we're seeing in the cell painting feature space? Found a lot of stuff that was known, which is nice validation always when you're building an assay. 
um, but found at least one that was interesting, uh, an anti-correlation between NF, or, uh, NF-kappa-B and HIPPO that didn't really have literature support. Um, so we were all computationalists. We had to talk to our friends and ask them to build us a reporter gene. But um, I'm showing you this, so surprise, it worked. Um, if you have a HIPPO reporter gene that you overexpress, and uh, when you overexpress NF-kappa-B pathway genes, HIPPO reporter expression goes down. So this is novel pathway-pathway interaction from organelle dyes and cell painting feature space. So this to me was the proof of like, wow, this stuff actually is really going to be powerful for doing discovery in terms of what our individual genes or drugs doing within cells. Um, and there's been a lot now in the last six years that has come out in terms of really cool applications of this tech. Um, so uh, drug resistance, um, can we test if uh, cells are resistant to a particular drug? Um, I have spent many hours looking at these pictures uh, left and right, don't look that different to me but they look pretty different to the computer and it can tell um, with pretty good accuracy and we're working on making it better, um, which cells are drug resistant or not. I, you can imagine how being able to test this in a dish is gonna be, would be potentially really, really valuable because this is an easy and cheap assay to scale. Um, we don't even necessarily need to be in the right tissue type. We just need to sort of have a, have a good biomarker. So um, this is work that's gonna be hopefully pre-printed, I think very soon. Um, this is skin fibroblasts from patients with various psychiatric conditions. We're not, these aren't brain biopsies. It's a lot easier to get people's skin than people's brains. Um, but we have a biomarker here that says that something in cell painting feature space is clustering some of these things differently. And so not only can we then use that to try and investigate the cause, but again, this is now a biomarker. You can imagine some potentials of how this could potentially be used for things like screening. Um, Beyond even just what we can do in individual assays, one of the nice things, because this assay is cheap and easy to scale, that we can start thinking about doing is, um, can we start predicting the outcomes of harder to scale, more expensive, more pain in the butt assays? Um, so the cell health assay is something that basically is another microscopy assay. You take two plates of data instead of one plate of data, and you get lots of particular measurements about particular aspects of if, what cell cycle phase the cells are in. Um, do they have DNA damage foci? Um, but that just really tells you about the cell's health. You don't really get a lot of extra information. So can we learn the res if we take parallel plates and we split them and we say, we're going to do the cell health assay over here, and then in paired plates, we're going to do cell painting. Can we actually predict what the cell health assay is based on cell painting? And it turns out 50% of the time, it works 100% of the time. Um, you know, there, there's still, th this was uh, just with regression models. This was not with anything terribly, terribly computationally fancy. Um, but you could imagine that if, you know, the phenotype you really care about is one of these down here, you're less excited. But a lot of these phenotypes for an assay that's then going to give you a lot of other extra information, um, you can get pretty darn well from cell painting, which is, again, if I haven't said enough yet, cheap and easy to scale. <laughs> Um, and this isn't just for other microscopy assays, so uh, this may have come out now. I forget if this is still actually in press, but um, Juan Caicedo, who just left Broad to start his own lab and were heartbroken, um, worked with Tim Becker and Nikita Moshkov to say if we take chemical structures and cell painting profiles and gene expression profiles, the L1000 assay that was um, being run quite a bit at Broad, and we dump them all in a deep learning model, what assays can we predict? Um, not just in terms of, you know, things like uh, cell assays, but even biochemical assays, things that are happening in yeast or in fungi, and you know these data at least were all from humans. It doesn't work for every phenotype. It doesn't work all the time. But considering you can do it with existing data, you know, with uh, cell painting morphology assays, we're able to predict a lot of cell assays, but also some bacterial assays and some yeast assays with, again, a data that you already have that essentially we can get for free. And so there's a lot, the richness of this data source says that there's a lot of really cool stuff we can think about doing. Um, we can now start, again, doing things like associating um, the morphology information um, with gene expression information for individual drugs in six dose points and say, um, how much of the time can we match replicates in cell painting versus gene expression versus both? And, you know, the, unsurprisingly, the answer is you can get uh, some of, you're only going to get the full set with both, but each one has different strengths. And um, this is a preprint that we're currently revising there. Um, now looking at this against GWAS. So iPSCs for many donors, they go through GWAS, you get all their SNPs. Um, we do cell painting, and then we say what genotypes are associated with which, uh, which cell painting measurements. 
Um, and the curse of dimensionality is biting us a little bit because we have so many measurements and so few patients. Um, but we were able to pull out a couple of reasonable associations where we see a uh, change between a cell painting feature and an individual SNP. And so reviewers said, okay, but how do you know this isn't just an association? You have 300 people. And so um, Matt Teg Tegmeyer, who's also about to leave, start his own lab, um, uh, actually crispered in some of these and showed that the you see the same direction of change when you crisper in these mutations as we saw in the original SNPs. Um, again, some of these features are human interpretable and a human could see, but some of them aren't. This is one of the ones that a human can see. Um, so the, the symmetry of the mitochondria around the nucleus um, is slightly changed by this hormone receptor. Why? I don't know. Someone should go figure that out. But um, again, we have a biomarker, but for only, I, I would point out, one of these three is something that a human can even see. And this one, you'd have to be looking pretty hard and for a pretty long time to actually untangle this versus that. Um, and so I keep saying all of this data that we already have that you have for free, um, we just last fall released the world's largest public cell painting data set, um, Jump. So we worked with um, 12 different partners um, to create uh, a, G a cell painting data set that has 117,000 compounds, 12,000 overexpressed genes, 8,000 CRISPR genes. Um, I think Anne Carpenter and Shantanu Singh are wizards because they got 10 pharma companies to all work together on a public data source that was going to be released for free. Um, and we actually physically had companies mailing each other compounds in the mail and occasionally getting stuck in customs um, so that we could have the same compounds screened at multiple sites. Um, and this is free for you right now, CC0. You can go online and you can get it. Um, Aaron Weisbart in my group, Aaron Chu at AWS and Shantanu have um, work really hard to make this a really great resource where there are a lot of experiments, some of which I talked about, some of which I haven't had time to talk about, but there is a lot of cell painting data on there. About half of that 600 terabytes is measurements and about half of it is pictures. Um, go check it out. Um, so yay, everything's great. And I told you we can do all of this incredibly powerful stuff. We're done, right? Not done. Uh, so the next part of this talk is going to be uh, really about work uh, from John Arevalo, um, who's sitting also in the back. Um, and so there's going to be there's a link and a QR code on all of these slides about a paper that will be hopefully preprinted really soon. Um, and so please do talk to John uh, about this work because it's really cool. Um, so I mentioned lots of compounds, lots of companies send everything in the mail. Um, this is a really powerful way to now start looking at batch effects. We heard batch effects talked about in lots of different sessions yesterday. This is a real problem. It's a real problem in sequencing and spatial transcriptomics. It's a real problem in microscopy too. So um, since we have compounds and things that were physically sent around to one another, John was like, okay, like let's see if now we can solve batch effects. Um, and so within each source, um, so each source is a company or, or, a, or an organization. Um, each one did multiple batches. Each batch contains multiple plates. Um, and most of the batches at most of the companies contained um, a marker plate that we call target two that has a standard 306 compounds. And so we can use that standard plate that's run in lots of places with a known compound uh, composition and known compound locations as the ability to sort of where our batch correction can start from. Um, and so John devised a series of increasingly complicated uh, and increasingly difficult benchmarks um, where we can start with just sort of one microscope from one lab and a small number of compounds and then start bringing in more labs but who all own the same microscope or more labs who own different microscopes um, and actually start then looking at a whole bunch of different batch correction methods, um, many of which have been proposed for sequencing and single cell RNA sequencing again, to sort of say, now we, we can create this benchmark data set, we can create this benchmark of how we can actually look at the performance of these different methods for imaging data. Um, and so um, here is gonna be what the, what the data in the paper looks like. And I'm gonna unfortunately not treat this as, as richly as it deserves and for as long as it deserves, but um, we can see that in the raw data, uh, this is coded by batch. So this particular uh, partner, uh, ran 13 batches of cell painting. The raw features are very heavily influenced by which batch, what day things were run. Um, and with some of the base, baseline things, we can actually then start looking both at 
ability to correct for batch effect and the amount of the biological information that we still keep. Because of course we don't want to just, you know, remove all of our batch effects and remove all of our biology alongside it. Um, and so John benchmarked this in a lot of different situations. And again, I strongly recommend you check out this work. Um, so in data from a single laboratory, these are all of these are arranged in terms of sort of aggregate score, you know, best to worst. Um, Harmony does a really nice job, but so do several other ones in terms of the ability to unscramble data from a single laboratory. Um, it gets harder when you then start saying, okay, three different laboratories all with the same microscope. Now uh, our colors are individual companies and, you know, Harmony and some of these other ones are still, we're getting good islands. These are our positive control compounds. Um, data not shown, but data in this QR code. Um, and, but again, it's sort of starting to get, we're getting blue kind of off to the side here. Uh, more microscopes, more problems. Um, you know, this problem is getting harder and harder. Um, and when we now have 80, all 80,000 compounds that were screened across those five sites, um, this problem is still really hard. And so um, we are really excited to meet with people and talk with people here about batch correction and what are the new and amazing algorithms that you're proposing. And can we, you know, in addition to trying them on things like single cell RNA-seq data, can we try them on imaging data too? Um, and this is going to be a huge part of the problem, but if we can work together on stuff, we can hopefully find find uh, algorithms that work for both kinds of data. Um, and yeah, this is just saying that yes, as the problem gets harder, the, the performance gets worse. Maybe, maybe not that surprising. Um, so just in my last few minutes, because I do want to leave time for questions, um, how I, I describe what to me is incredibly powerful biology from incredibly simple wet lab technology. How can we get this everywhere? How can we help people do this? Um, this is a preprint that our group recently put out. We, we do a community survey. We did one in 2022 and we did one in 2020 and we will hopefully keep doing them for quite a while. Um, this is the percent change in PubMed search results from 2022 to 2020 um, in terms of interest in deep learning. Um, and so in PubMed, we saw, you know, sort of about a doubling of the amount of uh, papers being published in terms of deep learning and AI. When it comes to how interested people who do microscopy are in deep learning and AI, does anyone want to make a prediction? Is it double? Is it triple? Did anyone want to say down 10%? Um, we're not doing a very good job of making these tools accessible. The, I, I've said 90% of our user base are people who say, if you make me use the command line, I will leave. Um, and so we really need tools that are going to make deep learning a hell of a lot easier to use than it currently is. And I think that this 10% uh, down was a really shocking number to me when we got that in. Um, and people want big data, at least people who sort of are at who understand the power of it. So the Society for Lab Automation and Screening, AKA people who care about big data, um, the hopes for the future of high content screening, high content microscopy. You see ML quite a bit on here. We need more data, we need more analysis, we need more ML. Um, and when we ask those people, you know, who are generally running microscopy labs where they're just doing screening and doing wet lab, you know, putting stains on cells and then putting them on a microscope, what do you want your employees to know Sorry, it's Python and not R. I didn't control it, this was them. But um, they want data science. And so um, there's demand for this, but our community is not able to get there. So we need some bridges. Um, we need to be able to get the life science community and the computer science community, especially in microscopy where there is this 400 year uh, backlog of, I'm just gonna look at the picture. Um, we need a ways to get there. Um, and so just in my last couple of minutes, many of this I know I'm going to be preaching to the choir because, again, I was here yesterday, but just to sort of emphasize the things that for us have really stood out as the ways to succeed. Um, In-app documentation, just sort of making the, the friction the smallest as possible between I have a question and I have the answer. If a user has to go and open the manual, you've lost them. And so putting our documentation literally as close to the software as we can for us has made a really huge difference. Um, and have that documentation be written, if at all possible, by end users. So this sort of spike here is when we were putting together Cell Profiler 3 um, and rewriting all of the documentation for Cell Profiler 3. And if you look at who was doing our GitHub commits um, during that sort of couple month span, um, we've got, we've got the, the, the two professional software engineers in the lab, but we also have a lot of people with biology backgrounds and it's being led by a couple people with biology backgrounds. Um, that helps make our documentation understandable by the people who need to read it. 
Um, we asked in that same survey I mentioned before, what do people think that tool creators can do to make tool users' uh, life better? They would really like some videos. Like they really want videos, like really, really, really want videos. Um, preferably friendly videos, easy videos, but they really just want videos. Um, and this was really surprising to me. The first we saw sort of the same between 2020 and 2022. Written tutorials really don't sort of scatter by um, how much skill you describe yourself as having with computation. Whether you're low, computationally high skill or low skill, you probably like written. You might be like it a little bit more, um, even if you're low skill. But videos are not what the computationally uh, skillful of us in the room tend to want to, to get. And so we're less likely to make, but it's what our end users really want. Uh, they also would really like some office hours, so be able to just drop in. So we've been doing these now for a few years where we just have every couple weeks drop in office hours. Um, centralizing as much as we can the information. So this is a project we started about four years ago, um, forum.image.sc, where we have 55 official partners, 55 open source software tools with one central discourse help forum. Um, it has, you know, it's probably closer to 200,000 posts now in more than 30,000 threads. Um, and just sort of making it so someone has a place to say, here's my picture, here's my question, somebody please God help me. Um, and someone from Self Profiler can say, oh, we're not the right tool for that, but go talk to the QPath guys here, let me tag them into your thread. And so centralizing the ability to ask for help for us has made a huge difference. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of good stuff already out there in microscopy land. And again, I'm not even going to touch on all the amazing good stuff that's happening in this community because that's what the whole rest of this meaning is. But um, image analysis, we're starting to embrace containerization. Um, so this is a paper saying that we're check checklist for publication of image analysis workflows, and we're able to push them to get containerization on the thing. Um, and so it's in the official recommended checklist now. Um, and we've been really, in our own lab, enjoying doing things to um, actually make it easy to containerize entire workflows using Gradio, um, which if you ever used Hugging Face or any of the ML model things on Hugging Face, it's the same interface that they use, where in the Docker desktop app, without ever having to touch the command line, all you have to do is say, what's the port to use? And then everything else is click buttons. And you can now start packaging image analysis apps. And of course, it needs to be reloaded because this is a you know, demo. But where now the user just gets a browser window. And they never have to see the command line. They never have to worry about the command line. And so we're really excited about these sorts of approaches of taking a small Docker container, sticking an easy to use interface in front of it, um, and moving forward. Um, we love things like um, AWS Batch and a lot of the other like things for running stuff um, in high content and high throughput. The problem being workflow languages are often really unapproachable for beginners. Um, and so this was something um, we recently published, um, a way to do uh, large scale job submission in AWS using only Python and um, JSON so that uh, someone who's a baby computer scientist, they can do just a tiny little bit of command line stuff. Um, can start staling things without having to learn Whittle or, or Nextflow or things like that. Those tools are great and they're amazing and I want more people to learn to use them, but until they do, we need to give them something. Um, and there's a lot of great community organizations. Um, again, you can look at these slides to sort of learn more about all of the amazing things that they're doing, but the, the Europe has AI for Life um, and the Network of European Union Bioimage Analysts, which is now gonna be the Society for Bioimage Analysts because we're gonna go global. Um, global bioimaging, neurobioimaging, there's a lot of community organizations out there who are now realizing that we are so behind all of you folks in terms of spatial transcriptomics and single cell RNA-seq and all those fields and really trying to catch up so that we can be part of this sort of data science community. Um, and this is not microscopy specific, but if you aren't involved in life science trainers, I have found that hugely helpful and met, I think, some of the people in this room on there in terms of people who teach about data science to life scientists. Um, I definitely recommend you check this out. Um, and so in conclusion, um, profiling allows us to create informative data sets that allow us to learn novel biology, but there's still some major technical challenges to solve, which is why we're here talking to our friends, and we hope that our friends can help us come up with great ways to do this. Um, and in microscopy, we have a fantastic community that is starting to come together and starting to organize in terms of image analysis and data science. And we would love to become part of the broader global data science community. So let's all work together and solve all of these problems and make better stuff. Um, if you want to find some of those people, um, I definitely recommend starting on forum.image.sc. Um, 
It is sponsored by uh, a joint NIHP 41 funded center that we are part of, the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis, which has a mission to build new technologies in collaboration with biologists who have what we call driving biological projects, and then go tell them about what we made and how they do what they need to do. Um, and so with that, I want to thank the amazing members of my lab, um, Anne Carpenter and Shantanu Singh, and all the amazing members of their lab, again, including John, who's here in the back. Um, conferences that you might be really interested in um, that are very related to the stuff I just talked about are highlighted here. But otherwise, here's our tools, here's our stuff, here's our money. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for an absolutely spectacular talk. Um, I have some questions, but I'm not going to ask them yet. I'm sure there are plenty, and we have time. Um, so uh, you just have to speak up. You don't have to have a microphone because we are pretty well mic'd. So any questions, please? Yes, Tim. Yes, Stephanie, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in case the mics didn't pick up, the question is about connecting morphology with spatial transcriptomics. Um, that's something we're super interested in. Um, I have a master student who's, who's back at lab today working on that right now. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of information where, again, in the same way we saw from, you know, bulk sequencing that we saw a lot of information that overlaps between morphology and that. And I think that's going to be hugely powerful. My dream is that it maybe means that with spatial transcriptomics, we can do a little bit smaller libraries and maybe make it a little bit cheaper and make it a little bit less pain to do. But um, yeah, it's something that I also think is super interesting. We're also super interested in active area of research. A slightly different version of the presentation, <laughs> uh, I guess, last week, and mm -hmm. it's just as, just as compelling as last time. But okay. one thing that struck me this time around, which was that you had the, the train going from life sciences to computer science, there's AI models, and then there were standards after AI models. Mm -hmm. So, my, my colleague Michael Hoffman has documented how extraordinarily poor many of our um, standards as they were mm -hmm. uh, are in bioinformatics and i don't know whether the situation is quite as grim mm -hmm. in imaging can can you cast some light on that yeah so the question's about standards in ai models and things for microscopy the situation is pretty grim but we're working on making it slightly better um especially so in the context of using uh ai to do segmentation um basically a bunch of the people in the field got together um in june in sweden and sort of sat down and said, we need to start creating some standards for things because we have something called the bioimage model zoo with like 50 different segmentation models and every single one of them has a unique post-processing layer. Um, and so we need to stop doing that and we need to come up with some community standards. I think at this point, the problem is recognized. I think it's far from solved. Um, again, I'm hoping things like, you know, containers with easy endpoints and endpoints will help. So then at least if you want to make your own weird thing, as long as we know what your output format is, like, okay, whatever. But yeah, there's still a tremendous amount that's not up to where I would love it to be in terms of reproducibility. I'm going to pose one question from the cloud. Is there a comprehensive bibliography or metadata on the 400 years of cell imaging data? Um, that is a really good question. Um, not in my head. <laughs> um, um, uh, li I think it's called Life of the Cell. Um, Joe Gall um, has a really uh, interesting book. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're ever in Leiden, um, they have a uh, history of microscopy uh, thing right now at their history of sort of scientific tools museum that I went and saw and that recently and that was spectacular but um, yeah a lot of people have written about sort of the history of microscopy in general but um, th those would uh, be some places to start. Just one more question before we go back to the audience. Do you have an impression of how significant cloud is in the practice of image analysis? That's a, that's a really great question. I think in general, the cloud is not very, um, not very prevalent at all outside of a few sort of 
places that do large scale screening. So we use a lot of cloud. Some of our pharma partners that we work with do a lot of cloud. Um, I should mention we're open to collaboration with anybody. Come talk to me. Um, but um, again, the 90% the of people who are like, if you make me use the command line, I will leave um, are not on the cloud yet. And we're, we're trying to do things to make it easier. Um, I, I'm really pushing all of my friends in the imaging software stuff to be like, Galaxy, just put everything in Galaxy. Galaxy is going to solve so many of our problems and put some resources into Galaxy too while we're at it. So we're not just taking up everybody else's Galaxy nodes, but um, we're, we're, we're still a ways away. Got it. Rafa, did you have a question? Please. Um, so you, you had mentioned you have biologists and computer scientists, no statisticians. Is uncertainty. <laughs> 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 is uncertainty not an issue with the United States? Why do you think that that hasn't happened? And it's also true that we bioconductors don't have any of these kinds of data. Shantan, is it fair for me to call you a statistician? Would you, would you, or would you be mad at me if I called? Rafa knows me well enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, if he wasn't here, I would probably say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The question is about where statistician. I, I think they're an incredibly important part of this. I think we're still at the point where a lot of biologists aren't making enough data. But I will say um, this bioimaging guide thing that I've linked here. Um, we are really trying to push to biologists that data visualization and proper statistical treatment is part of you know the microscopy life cycle. Um, it is really important um, because our data sets have traditionally been so small and it's like, here's my two features, like statisticians are like, go away, you're very uninteresting to me. But I think as we start making the search data set, part of it is we can sort of then pull in some more people who are really interested in fancy statistics. Thank you. Very nice talk. I was discussing this struck by the batch effects so when it's like every lab, every compound, everything else. So I was wondering, when you're trying to generate features or like model and try to figure out from the image, how much of a risk is overfitting when you're trying to generate it? Like, is every lab that publishes a paper that has good accuracy of prediction only going to be applicable for their lab and it won't work when mm -hmm. my lab or somebody else tries to do it because our microscope is different than that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. The question was about overfitting and overfitting features to particular experiments. I mean, I think what all that batch correction stuff is, is says that the individual measurements are going to be tuned, again, not even just to like the individual lab, but the day stuff was run. Um, and microscopy is an incredibly involved and complex thing, and the sample prep is really comp complex and involved. Um, I think that's why people need to make really good stuff, um, and I'm excited to see what the really smart people come up with, because I'm not going to be the one who comes up with it. <laughs> are you okay for a few more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah, so thank you for the talk. Um, I'm really excited by moving into 3D space. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the tissue clearing methods are now getting really, really good resolution and uh, a lot of different measurements with both uh, morphology and gene expression. Um, I'm wondering how much, I've been out of the microscopy world for a while now, I'm wondering how much work is uh, being done there in terms of machine learning models who can take advantage of that 3D, very complex space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. The question's about um, 3D imaging and 3D sort of like, especially now with clearing and spatial transcriptomics and morphology and stuff all in 3D. I'm not aware of people doing much with it. I agree, it's incredibly exciting. I think a lot of it is the, the computational expertise and power and stuff is really concentrated in a very finite number of places, which are not necessarily always the same places that are generating the data. But I'm, I think that that's probably something we're going to start seeing lots of papers on. And I'm really excited to see how it turns out. Another question in the back here. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say great, great talk and great job answering questions. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering, does your lab use physical notebooks, digital notebooks, or both? That's a great question. Physical or digital notebooks? Um, we everything is digital. Um, what is the right note like digital like way of documenting things is something that we've been trying to come up with best practices. The least worst thing we found so far has really just been GitHub um, and using GitHub issues and GitHub discussions to track experiments and then being able to link them to code. Um, it's not that fancy, but um, it's what for us because the more steps that you introduce, the more steps but between like data can fall through the cracks. And so I think those have been the projects where we've been the most successful is literally just everything, including your sort of progress notebook stays in GitHub. Yes, Mike. A really like, simple question. So for univariate data like gene expression, you can show a box plot among different groups. Um, if you have these more complex features, like morphological features, you can show the 
the like the average of this group and the average of that group. That maybe this is like getting to Rafa's question. Can how do you show variance in the two groups? That's a great question about um, the the variance in different kinds of features and stuff. Um, yeah, people just generally kind of do it badly. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I don't have a slide for it, but uh, Shantanu, I know, has put in the, the cell painting wiki um, looking at different features, and some of them are very bimodal, and some of them are unimodal. And some, um, generally, people just kind of do whatever. Um, and I you know, for a lot of the, the high content stuff where we're doing the lots and lots of features, a lot of it just ends up being, we're doing median mad normalization and then just sort of saying, all right, we're gonna hope that most of them are Gaussian and, that, and that's just the best we can do because the feature distribution shapes are all wildly different, but um, it would be great to have better ways to handle that. But as far as I know, the problem right now is so complex that we're mostly just kind of punting on it. It's not a great answer, but it's the one I got. <laughs> Last chance, ah, Tyrone. Hi, uh, I apologize, I was stuck in traffic, but again, and- In Boston? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, forgive me, you just already addressed this right there, but, in, uh, but make four megapixel Im images, you can get, 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 it, get it on your cell phone. So, keep transmitting and sending this, since we have so much images floating around the net, should be fairly easy, but it, it, mm -hmm. it isn't for my problem. So could you talk to me maybe on findable, interoperable, accessible, reproducible images haven't already? And uh, go ahead. No, that's a great question. Um, we're doing a terrible job in that so far, Microsoft, in terms of making data fair and making images fair. Um, there are a couple of repositories that are just dump your data, there's no metadata required. And there are a couple that are like, you need to go through a sort of 100 step checklist. Um, and there's great data there, but there's very little data there because nobody's going to do it. Um, I'm part of a couple different working groups that are working to try and incentivize funders to fund this journals to require it and things like that, because we have petabytes and petabytes of microscopy data that's all unorganized and all could be mined um, if we could actually just find it. Um, and this is something that uh, I can talk to folks if you're interested in getting involved in those working groups, I can help connect you, but it's um, it's something where there's right now a huge missed opportunity and a lot of us are working hard to try to fix it. Last chance, yes, please, Maria. I just have a question on your point on video tutorials. Mm -hmm. Like I agree they're a great thing. And I also know they're probably less done because they can take more work to create and then to keep updated. So do you have any thoughts on how you would keep them not getting out of date? Yeah, the questions on video tutorials and them getting out of date. I know basically the only thing that worked for me is I had to start actually just doing them as live streams because they do take forever. Like I will, I will edit them to death, you know, forever. If and so just saying, nope, I'm going to go on and it's going to be at this time and it's going to be recorded and it's going to be what it is. And I think, and a lot of times with video tutorials, perfect ends up being the enemy of done. At least that's my experience. Um, and so I think just sort of saying, all right, I'm going to have a standing sort of time and like, and so we started doing that during COVID. We then, when people were stuck home with their data and like didn't know what to do with it, we've. We fell off doing it and I, we're not doing as good a job as we could in terms of making video tutorials. But I would say just just making, just making, getting it done. And it, for me, I'm deadline motivated, but just making it done and it doesn't have to be perfect. If it's there, it's gonna be better than it not being there at all. Ideal length or too long? Yeah, ideal length. Um, I am wordy, as you may have picked up on. So my videos tend to go like 50 minutes. Um, I think probably, more like 10 minutes is better, or at least having some chapters and stuff in there. Um, I don't tend to do a good job of that. I think my shortest are like 25. <laughs> well, absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, uh, I don't know how much longer you're gonna be around here, but- I'll, I'll uh, be here all day. Do catch up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we need to stop so that we can get to our next meetings, but um, many, many thanks. One minute.